Okay, now we're continuing. Um, you see a, a rectangular board here? That goes up to the top of the floor. So that's how deep the footer is. It's 2 foot by 11 inches. And uh, we put that on the edge of this short piece of wall footer here. That wall footer is only like 20 feet long. So uh, that's going to pour everything to the right of this and everything from that board to the batter board over there. Um, this finale board here, he's going to, uh, it's, it'll be five inches wide. And he's going to cut some two inch uh, deep notches in it. It's the same spacing as the notch boards. And that'll be your divider that separates this concrete from the next pour. Um, and we generally make those out of the worst thing we got, little bits and pieces and stuff. The more jagged it is, the better it fits together like a puzzle. It locks the two floors together. But apparently, oh, he's only got some, uh, well, it's obviously used, but it's in pretty decent shape. Something he could cut into strips. Uh, well, we caught somebody on it this time. That's Benji. Okay, we're looking at uh, columns. What? That's the uh, that's the east. So this is south, short, medium, and long. This is south. So he's in the southeast lower corner, and he's uh, putting a couple of rebars across there. He, he had them tied in threes, and now he's putting a single rebar. That this is going to stand him up more vertical. Now, if he didn't want to do that, he could have left them tied in threes. They only stick out like two inches out of the concrete. So how far leaning left or right could it be? You could drop a pipe down over that and uh, bend it up. And it might be seven and a half on one and an eight on the, uh, the next one to it. But he wants them all to be what they're supposed to be. Uh, often... We would take a notch board and tie it across the top here and plop those in the notches too and make it a perfect grid. Uh, that's not really necessary because this is a four foot high wall down here. It's a, this wall, the purpose of this wall is uh, two things. <clears throat> We've had uh, the property lit on fire five times since we've uh, been out here. And uh, I don't want to have uh, all kinds of brush and stuff growing up under the solar array and somebody sets fire to the place. And damages the panels or burns up the wiring or the saw. The, the, these panels, uh, that, uh, the silver, uh, connectors are soldered onto the, uh, the silicon wafers. It doesn't take much heat to mess up a solder joint. So, uh, we have that. And the second thing is come from, from, uh, not his back too much, but pretty much over top of these, uh, trees here coming this way. That's our prevailing wind direction. Uh, off of the uh, <clears throat> uh, South China Sea. Now, the house is up here, which is part of the wind block, but uh, we can get, uh, you know, 90 mile an hour winds across here. This All the rest of the walls are higher, but the solar panels are set down in this compound. The, the sun gets to them, but any wind coming straight across, you know, linear uh, wind will go right across the top of it. And plus, having the taller walls back here to the prevailing wind, there's not much uh, wind at all going to get down in here where the, all these panels are. Um, that wall in the back is like 11 feet high, and this wall is 4 feet. So it's, it's protection from wind, and uh, somewhat, I don't think you can stop anybody from, from carrying something off if they want to. But we'll write our name in with uh, spray cans in real big letters on the back side of them. Uh, before we put them up, or after we put them up, we can write. There's plenty of room to walk around under here. Anyway, that's what Benji's doing. He's uh, he's putting some bars like he's got here on the right. Uh, you can see them on the uh, south. Actually, he's using some of the uh, what we call red bars. See the bend in them. I, I don't think he so much intended to double those up as just the lap that, that came out when he uh, when he used two bars because there was nothing to tie the other end to. It would be hanging down. So he just overlapped them whatever it took to uh, 
you know, to get the, the part that goes up on the right and the part that went down on the left. <clears throat> Just so they're not trying to, to lean something over. And you can see there's probably an eighth of an inch to three sixteenths lean at the on these at the bottom. Uh, be it these bars are 50% uh, closer space than they need to be for uh, for this floor. I uh, really don't think that makes any difference. That's, a, that's the same guy. He's got a new hat. He almost fooled me. From the shape of this guy, I'd say that's Boyette taking the pictures. And that would be Boyette's finger across the lens. Another reason why I think he's Boyette. Um, this is an inventory of some rebars. You say, how many of those, uh, white, uh, 20 foot full length bars do you have? He took pictures, this many. You want to know, you count them. Okay. Uh, <coughs> <coughs> they got them. Pretty much got a grid going. But they have to, the next bar will be overlapped 16 inches heading that way. <clears throat> so they'll need to put down another layer of plastic, another, another strip of plastic. And they have to extend these bars uh, through where the notch boards will be. So they go from one slab to the next. <coughs> Crap. Now when we're doing a, um, a round floor is a good example. We'll take a bar... It's somewhere around the thing, <clears throat> like the, the diameter group, run right, right across the middle of the of the of the circle. Take a bar, run it as far as it goes. Overlap it sixteen inches. Run it to where to where it gets to the within an inch and a half of the far side, <clears throat> and cut it off. Whatever length that piece is, you bring it back down here and you start the next parallel bar with that bar. So you started with a twenty foot bar, and now you got a piece that's anywhere from Three feet below that, we, below three feet, we use them for uh, uh, corner uh, joints. You know, you, cracks run from ninety degree inside corners, so you put a couple of them uh, at forty five across the corners, and those are handy for that. Rather than cutting the bar, I just use those. I don't care if they're a little long. Put the longest one closest to the concrete, and the, another one that's a little shorter, uh, three inches out. Anyway, so you keep doing that, and what you end up with. Is staggered joints across your concrete. There's no row of joints that are all lined up. Because, see, that's that's twice as much reinforcement where the bars lap. And then you get a uh, stress riser at the end of the bar. So, uh, normally, if we were doing anything other than, than a perfect rectangle, we, we we start, take the last piece, and put it for the first piece. This, um, aside from being a, making a, a slightly stronger piece of concrete from not having... Uh, the, the overlap's all in a row. Uh, there's zero waste. That's important. Steel's the most expensive thing uh, on a piece of slab, followed by the Portland cement. So, uh, okay, suppose we did that, and then we, if, if it was a circle, we'd do the same thing going 90 to it. <clears throat> we'd still end up with the notch boards having made this, these squares. So you go to pour it. What you want to do is you want to take this board that's up here... Uh, laying in the grass up here, laying in the dirt, you want to take that notch board for your parting line between the, the different pores you have, and you want to put that at an angle across these bars. 45 degrees is nice. Like if I if I catch uh, this bar in the center of that square and go across the center of, of the next bar, and of course by default we'll go across the center of this part of the square, so it's center, 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 center. <clears throat> what you end up with is every bar in the floor is at 45 to the, the joint, but one, uh, all the bars are reinforcing the joint. There's no uh, half the bars going uh, through the notches like it's going to be on this floor, and the other half running parallel to it. <clears throat> so the, when you run them, if you, if you can put your parting lines at, at 45 degrees, uh, and and you have multiple slabs in a bigger floor, it's much stronger. Now the downside is there's no problem here on this uh, this 90 degree corner. Um, like I say, we'll probably put a couple pieces in here across that corner 
just to keep it from running the crack. But <clears throat> when you get out here to where that 45 hits, you've got a 45 degree corner. Uh, that's a problem to keep that end from coming off. So you have to take like, um, fan out like a Japanese fan of bars from the, from the end point and only about four inches apart on the other end. And you want them to be, uh, uh, longer in the middle and shorter towards the sides, like an arc. They want them all in a line where they end. And you have to reinforce those, those, uh, those, now the next is a 135 degree corner. No problem with that one. Over here, this is a 135 degree corner. No problem with that one. But you'll have a few places where you end up with 45 degree corners. <clears throat> and, and for me, it's worth it to have 100% of the bars going across the joint, holding the two slabs at the same height. <clears throat> Just a thought. Like, you know, uh, advice on the internet is what you pay for it. It's what it's worth. Nothing. Um, <clears throat> this, uh, this is where our partition wall goes. And it goes over to up here and, and then takes off straight again. And, uh, this big room back of here, we're starting off with, uh, what looks like, uh, we've ordered seven, uh, inverters, um, four hybrids and three that charge batteries and make 220. <clears throat> the hybrids, uh, can backfeed, uh, net metering on the grid. And when you have these, um, uh, fish tanks and shrimp tanks, commercial tanks, hundred some thousand gallons of water in, in tanks. You have to uh, circulate it to to separate the solids out through a radio flow separator and and uh, a biological filter uh, to kill the ammonia. It turns it into nitrates, and we cycle that through plants to take out the nitrates and make pretty pure water. Actually, um, it's got color to it. I wouldn't drink it because it's not crystal clear, but uh, it wouldn't hurt you. You know, you drink it right out of the fish tank, it might because it's full of ammonia. Yeah, intensively stocked fish put out a lot of ammonia. That's uh, like we breathe out carbon dioxide. They breathe out ammonia through their gills. And they pollute their own water. So you have to have electric 24-7. That's the reason for the solar. That because it's the price of electricity is going up in the Philippines. Uh, I don't know, 10% a year maybe. And the power outages are going up even faster. There's people in Bohol. They have scheduled outages. Uh for half a day, three days a week sometimes. And unscheduled, uh, when they don't schedule, they might have uh, three a day. And, and then they might go four or five days and have perfect power. Even though it's 180 volts to 275 volts, it varies all over the place. <clears throat> We're going to use uh, some uh, pool filter uh, pumps. And they also blow water through a venturi, which uh, puts the air in the water. They uh, don't really like to be uh, running on all these weird voltages. And what you get with a uh, an inverter is a perfect sine wave, nearly perfect. And uh, exactly on the right phase and exactly on the right voltage. You set the voltage with a tenth of a degree accuracy on the voltage. So you've got a power conditioner built into the system for zero charge. It's all when you set those 70 lines of uh, code when you're, when you're setting the thing up. You just uh, push the down button, the next item comes up, and you look at the book and, and find out which one you're supposed to, which letters you're supposed to punch. And uh, the first one will take about two hours to program. The second one will take 20 minutes. And then to turn the first one on, you're going to go back and check all the connections and check for shorts and check for opens and check for low battery cells and pre-charge the condensers and all that stuff. And then it takes some nerve to throw that first switch. Because you got it wrong. That inverters, uh, they're $439 for the, uh, um, grow watt that, that makes, uh, battery power or solar power into battery power and takes the 48 volt from the batteries and turns it into, to, uh, in our case, 220, 60 cycle. So you don't want to blow that thing up. You really can't damage the, the solar panels. They have blocking diodes, uh, in the uh, combiner box or just in front of it in the in the connector you can put them either place i specify them made into the combiner box um because they do such a nice neat job on that kind of stuff in, in china why would you you know bother trying to hack it together out in the field um 
Okay, and then you got all this these lipo batteries back here. <clears throat> you got to have a real healthy respect for uh, a 10 kilowatt lipo battery at 48 volts. Um, I don't know how many amps that would be. Um, well, if you divide 48 into 10 kilowatts, then the 10,000, uh, is that 300 volts or something like that? Anyway, it's a significant voltage. The uh, PV panels uh, can put out up to 500 volts for, for uh, the, the strings that we use. That's the ones that are in series. Each panel is like, I think we got 42 volts per panel. So if we put 10, that's 420. And the inverter is good for 550. The farther you can stay away from that uh, watt limit on the inverter, the cooler it runs. So we're not pushing the voltage into the thing. But it takes a healthy respect for something that can jump an arc, a quarter inch in diameter, about eight or nine inches to a ground. And if you have a, if you try to shut it off with a circuit breaker, uh, as you break the breaker, it turns the air inside of the breaker to a plasma, which conducts better than the copper wires. And uh, there's no stopping that. The first thing happens is the, uh, the heat from the plasma destroys the breaker, melts it down, blows it all over the room. The plasma uh, is still generated by the open circuit wires that are, that are jumping the gap because it might have 3,000 amps coming through it. Uh, a T-series fuse will stop it. You have to have that. But if you haven't got it, you can discharge that entire battery. And the batteries get hot when they discharge. LiPos are very safe batteries. You can charge them really fast. They hold a lot. Uh, they don't overheat uh, all on their own and just, you know, like uh, like the 18650 cells, like in Tesla cars and stuff. Uh, they're a newer technology. They're not lithium ion. They're lithium iron phosphates. Two different things all together. It's like when you change from carbon batteries to NiCad back in the 60s, early 70s. NiCad is nowhere similar to a carbon flashlight battery. Uh, and those were in the, in the original power tools. But then they went to the uh, lithium ion, which, you know, they store like, uh, what are they, I don't know, 3 volts? 3.42 3 or something like that. <clears throat> and you stack them up to where you get to like 19 volts. Some of them are up to 70 volts on some things. What are we talking about? Oh, we're talking about rebar. Rebar. And and the little black, uh, little blocks of concrete chairs. Uh, and next. Oh, lucky you. This is the last picture of yesterday's pictures. So uh, they're, they're putting these... Um, these... Uh, what we call the horizontal bars or the east-west bars. When they get that, then they're going to add the 20-foot pieces and they'll put the uh, divider uh, straight across from here to there. Part of this floor over here will be part of this block and the rest of it ends right on the edge of that ditch. Um, the only thing underneath the here is quail cages. And uh, I'm going to put the... Uh, the nests up here with a slanted bottom in so the eggs roll out to you. And uh, the rest of it uh, is flight cages. And these things are making eggs for you, and eventually you're going to kill them and eat them. Uh, why should they be trapped in, a, in something uh, a couple two feet by three feet, eight inches high? They can't jump, they can't fly. It takes all the living out of life. So we're going to let them fly around in there. They won't grow as fast because they won't eat as fast. But they'll make just as many eggs. They'll make an egg a day. Sometimes a little better than an egg a day. And uh, I don't want to feed 50% uh, uh, of the flock male birds that don't make any eggs. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, have a window grill. This regular grill is like, on the, like up here on the house. Uh, I like the angelfish grill the best of the bunch. But we'll, we'll pick one that's got some bigger holes in it they can fly in and out of. And we'll, we'll have feed and water. For uh, the excess uh, male quail birds. But if they want to go out and sit in the trees out here. Or fly around the town and come back. That's alright. They'll eat here. But they'll go out there and they'll forage for themselves. And when they get to where they can feed themselves. We won't have to see them anymore. But I don't want to kill them. And I uh, don't want to eat them when they're underweight. Yeah, that's a waste of time. So we're going to let them. Uh, let the end of their flight cage. Have an escape. We did that with the pigeons. 
They come and go as they, they please. They live on the roof uh, half the time. I don't think we even have a pigeon enclosure anymore, not a, an actual cage. The turkeys, we lock them in the dirty kitchen at night. Um, but once we get the, the dirty kitchen fitted out with cabinets and appliances, we're going to have to have a, a schooner cage out here we can drag around for the turkeys because they're free roam turkeys. You keep poultry in, uh, in, in tight cages, uh, the smell is terrible. The town will be down on you in just, you know, a month. And they'll make you get rid of them. It's happened to one guy twice. But ours don't make out any. We have complaints. And they found out it was somebody down the road about a mile. But they sent the Baron guy police to us to because to, we had a complaint. Our turkeys were stinking up in the neighborhood. <clears throat> they got down here. We had zero flies and zero stink. <laughs> and a bunch of turkeys ready to attack them. Uh -huh. Turkey, turkeys, by the way, is the easiest uh, of the birds to keep. Um, they're easier than ducks. Ducks are dirty birds. You know, you, you have to clean up after them every day. They just put out so much crap. So much smelly crap. And they're a big bird, so they put out a lot of it per bird. And they flock together. They, they stay absolutely tight. So it's just a... It's like pavement when they walk by. Anyway. Ducks make noise. Ducks smell. Uh, ducks get sick. They don't get sick as bad as chickens. Chickens, chickens, they die just for any reason. It's like they get up in the morning. And say, oh, what are we gonna do to die today? And half of them say, well, I think I'm gonna die today. Oh, okay. I'll, 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 I'll see you. Uh, you know, whenever. But uh, the turkeys are pretty easy to keep. Uh, they do an egg a day, and the eggs are big. You know, bigger than chicken eggs, bigger than a grade A large chicken egg, but way smaller than a duck egg. Sort of like halfway in between. But they're free range. They don't uh, have much problem getting them in at night. You walk over and pick up the, uh, the the smallest bitty that's walking around with the flock. They stay together. It's sort of a mob, sort of single file mob. It's something like uh, like geese. And you see geese walking around on the ground. They're all single file. Looks like an army marching. Well, that's that's what turkeys do. And you can uh, you walk over and pick up one of the small ones. If the smallest one you got is a foot tall, that's what you pick up, and you walk away with it. And the 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 uh, uh, male t turkeys will see you got that bird, <clears throat> and they'll come right with you. And all the rest of them are following them, so they follow the the male birds. And you take them into where you want them to to go, and stand there holding that little bird until they all come in the door. You set it on the floor, and you can walk right back through them and close the door behind them. And it works every day. Luring them with food doesn't necessarily work. But carry off a bitty, they follow you anywhere. And also, um, obviously, we got we don't uh, have a screen over the sky. Uh, we don't have much of a fence around this place. Just a little bit of barbed wire and some concrete posts. And it, the first turkeys took, um, I would say, a month and a half of somebody going out there and scaring them back through the fence. And after that, they didn't go out of the fence. And each generation teaches the next. So we start off with four turkeys, and I don't know how many there are now. Several. I'd venture to say I've seen 50 sometimes. Um, and anytime we have a birthday or, or something like that, uh, wedding anniversaries, we have the guys uh, or, or the neighbors cook a turkey, you know. That keeps the uh, number of male turkeys you're feeding down. They don't. Uh, have, get into arguments so much if there's less of them. <clears throat> the quail, it's uh, one male quail, f uh, five female quails throwed in a cage. And they make eggs. Okay, this video's got long, and this is the last picture that they sent yesterday. So I would expect that tomorrow, these bars here are upside down. The long end goes in this. They've got the long end in the slab. Son of a gun. Huh. Okay. Uh, anyway, we should see some 20-foot bars hanging out and some start of these uh, uh, blocking forms between the sections they're going to pour. It'll be uh, 20 feet by 19 feet. And then uh, we're going to put some short pieces on uh, every fifth one of these uh, on the lower edge here and lay two or three bars across the top of them out here and tie them to reinforce that footer. I know that they'll be six inches above the bottom of the footer instead of the inch and a half they're supposed to be. Um, 
It's just the easy way to do it. <clears throat> and this, this, like I say, this wall was only four feet tall. So I don't think there's going to be much leaning the wall over trying to snap off this uh, uh, 11 inches thick piece of concrete. I wouldn't think so anyway. And the leverage is almost uh, zero because the, the bar comes right out of the surface of the concrete into the bottom of the wall. So that's all the uh, leverage you got is the half the thickness of the wall. So that'd be three and a half inches of leverage over to the edge of the wall. And I don't know what would push it over. Maybe a a good sized jeepney at, at 50 miles an hour might knock it over. Or it might just destroy the jeepney. Who knows? Okay, that's 25 minutes. That's way, way too long. And um, say a prayer for the sick people that are still suffering from this pandemic. And say a, a prayer for the Ukrainians. They sure didn't ask Russia to come down there and mess with them. So from the from the um, the reports in the news, uh, they've pretty much uh, made a bad day for the Russians, <clears throat> and every day gets worse. Russians lost nine uh, airplanes at you know twenty five million dollars a piece in one day. That's how come they left Afghanistan, as uh, Ronald Reagan supplied the. Uh, uh, the Afghans with those Stinger missiles, and they were averaging seven of those uh, 27 or $30 million hind helicopters every day. They fly around amongst those wall, uh, those valleys, and there's caves all over the place with guys sitting there with Stinger missiles. You hear whop, 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 and they just step out and knock it all to pieces. So the Russians were, were uh, they ground their economy down. They uh, pretty much went bankrupt. USSR broke up in individual states. A hundred twenty-five thousand dollars Stinger missile against <laughs> some helicopters were thirty-five million. The newer ones and the older ones were like twenty-six or twenty-seven. Back in back in Vietnam, we were flying uh, uh, Phantom Fours, and our Phantom Fours were twenty-five million dollars a piece, and they were building bunches of them. So they would be frightful expensive if they were only building a hundred. But in, in the quantities involved, you know. Of course, we had uh, three times as many MiGs in the sky, probably. And all I had to do was watch the, uh, for black smoke and follow it to the plane. They're there and just burned clean. You couldn't tell where they were unless you could see them. Okay. Have a nice day. I'm going to turn this off.